Hello, welcome again. Today I'm here to deliver my third lecture on Terry Eagleton's book, Literary Theory and Introduction. And please don't be intimidated by the title of this chapter, which is Phenomenology, Hermeneutics, and Reception Theory. Because I know these are slightly intimidating terms, but if we understood what he's trying to do with the discussion of phenomenology, hermeneutics, and then reception theory, then I think it's easier to understand the chapter. But first of all, uh, like all his other chapters, I had mentioned in one of my previous lectures that Eagleton is a Marxist and a, and a materialist. So that means his way of explaining the world is materialistic and not idealistic. And so the distinction is that if you are an idealist, you believe that ideas emerge and the world changes because of them. If you're a materialist and believe in Marxian dialectic, then the world changes, right? The mode of production changes. There are material changes in the world that impact human thought and consciousness. And that's how thought and actions shift. That's the slight distinction. And how can you tell that about Eagleton, even from within the text, is that he always pretty much starts a chapter by material things that might have been happening a certain time, and because of which a certain philosophy or a philosophical way of looking at the reality emerges. So just like in this chapter, he mentions immediately after the First World War, 1920s, Europe is in turmoil. You know, he mentions the Berlin Spetricus uprising, Vienna general strike, and other socialistic movements all over Europe, which are, of course, crushed. But there's a lot of turmoil post-war. And within that, con within those material conditions is when Edmund Husserl decides as a philosopher to bring some kind of order to this material chaos in society. And his way of doing that is to theorize. The idea is that if we could reach the essence of things, right? If we could draw out or understand essentially the concepts and ideas, then maybe there wouldn't be this kind of chaos because maybe we will be able to retrieve a certain kind of universal agreement about things. And that is what launches Husserl's, you know, phenomenology. So in its essence, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, what is Husserl trying to do? What he's trying to do is that if we could understand concepts in their true essence, we could gain a better understanding of the world. But what he argues is that in order to do that, we must dispel the natural attitude. And what does he mean by the natural attitude? The natural attitude is believing that things exist in the world and we see them, right? And that's our perception of things. What he suggests is that no, things exist in the world because we, as human beings, posit them, we make them appear, we intend them. So intention is huge in phenomenology. How? So anything in the world that exists, it exists only because my thought, my consciousness acknowledges it, right? And hence, in the process of doing so, it intends it. Now, it's not mentioned in the chapter, but this is a huge step, which would have larger implications in social justice theory, in literary studies that wants to deal with the issues of poverty and equity in the world, because it claims that thought is outward tending, right? That it always has an object that comes from Husserl. And since thought always has an object and seeks it outside of a self, that brings us to one of the most formidable challenges to the Cartesian 
cogito, right? In Descartes, like if you read the first meditation, the whole idea is that you have withdrawn from the world in this small cabin in the Alps where you are thinking yourself. In order to find yourself, you go inwards, right? And hence, you know, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. The idea that I know I exist because in the process of thinking about my own existence, I know that I am thinking that existence, right? So the definition of our very humanity is forced inwards, right? And that Cartesian split, you know, between mind and body, and mind is the what this what that decides that we exist, is inverted in Husserl, because thought, according to Husserl, is outward tending, so it seeks an object. It always has an object, and that creates space in literary theory and in other kinds of philosophy for connecting myself to this other outside of me, right? And creates space then to think of the other, to learn and understand the world from the point of view of the other and the integral importance of the other in constituting a thought or projecting it or positing an object. So how do you do that? How do you understand an object in uh, Husserl's in, uh, phenomenology is by bracketing out everything else. So that's called an eidetic reduction, right? By bracketing everything that's not relevant to the object that you're positing, that's how we understand this is what it is because we bracket out everything else that's not relevant to that. And the idea was that if we could perform that kind of bracketing, we will then understand the true essence of things, right? That we or ourselves have posited. Now, before I move on to the next section, I had promised that I would try to explain why is he discussing all these philosophical concepts. So if you uh, watched my previous lecture, that lecture ends on Eagleton explaining the rise of neocriticism and formalism and practical literary criticism. And one of the main traits or claims of that kind of criticism was that the text itself is the only thing that we must study, right? The authorial intention doesn't matter. The reader's feelings or politics should not matter. The text has a primacy and the text must be read. Now in this chapter, the last part of the chapter title is reception theory. Eagleton is trying to explain as to how the reader enters this discourse. How is it that in literary theory, we start accounting for how the reader receives a text? And in order to do that, in order to get there, it's slightly a progressive narrative. I think it's made progressive. What he's trying to then explain in philosophical terms is, okay, in philosophy, how does that shift happen, right? From one to the other, where the perception of the reader himself or the reading act of the reader himself becomes more important than the object itself, which is a literary text, which is a book. So that's the movement that he's trying to trace. And in order to do that, he is providing us the discussions of these main philosophical currents. I hope that makes things clear. Now, then on uh, page 51, Eagleton explains one of the schools of criticism that emerges out of phenomenology, which is the Geneva School, and the kind of criticism that they do is called phenomenological criticism, right? And uh, in his word, phenomenological criticism is an attempt to apply the phenomenological method to literary works. How? So as with Husserl's bracketing of the real object, the actual historical context of the text is bracketed out. Anything else that might be outside the text, the author's biography, the author's life, the author's class is also bracketed out. So what is phenomenological criticism is that the critics are looking at a text as an arrived intention of the author. Remember, 
Husserl's, one of the claims was that we posit the objects in the world. We are the one who posit the reality. So that means whatever object we posit is a creation of our intention, right, as subjects. So if the text is the arrived intention of the author, phenomenological criticism then would suggest that we should bracket out everything else, the authorial uh, experience, author's biography, class, gender, the historical context within which the text was produced, and then read the text as the arrived intention of the author. And if we read it carefully enough, we can retrieve from it a map, right? An understanding of the author's mind because the authorial intention is in it because the text is the arrived intention of the author. So that's, these are some of the things about the phenomenological criticism. Now, so one thing that comes clear through this about understanding of phenomenology is uh, that the work, if you're looking at the essence of things, then history does not really matter because essences you know, can be timeless. How does history enter into this debate? And that's where he goes to Heidegger, right? One of the students of Husserl, right? And Heidegger's main contribution, and you can read the whole discussion, but to literary criticism is this idea of Dasein, right? The being. The being for Heidegger exists in history, right? Exists in time, right? And since the being that he's studying and talking about exists in time, that allows the critics to enter history and historical context into an act of phenomenological reading. So if we are going to read a text, right, and we know that the person reading it and the person writing it, they exist in time then we must account for that. And so that then creates space for placing the reader and the author within historical time. Now, the major critique of uh, Heideggerian method, and there's a lot, about three pages of discussion on Heidegger, the most important being Heidegger's claims about language, right? His claim that language speaks us, right? We don't speak it. Heidegger also has a couple, uh, some really important essays on how to read literature, right? But um, Eagleton's critique of that is that even while Heidegger is placing this being, the scene in history, right? It's not really the contextual history in which we exist. And two, that at the end, what Heidegger is proposing is not we being in history as agents of change, but at a mystical level, maybe it's we listening to nature and the murmurs of the world, right? We in a receiving situation, which kind of calls for, you know, a more passive reception of nature, but also in a way, the, a more passive reception of the text. So we may not really um, interpret it, but we may just receive the text, right? That's the limitation in, in the Heideggerian version that comes from phenomenology. And that's when he goes to hermeneutics, right? Now hermeneutics, simply what he means and what he, and he says that on page 57 is that uh, hermeneutics means the science or art of interpretation. Okay, Heidegger's form of philosophy is generally, generally referred to as hermeneutical phenomenology. And the word hermeneutics was originally confined to the interpretation of sacred scripture, but during the 19th century, it broadened, broadened its spoke, scope to encompass the problem of textual interpretation as a whole, right? And from there, he goes into, uh, you know, uh, Gadamer, who comes, of course, after 
Heidegger. And Gadamer's question of, you know, how are meanings of literary works produced? And on page 61, um, what he is discussing about Gadamer is that uh, for Gadamer, the meaning of a literary work is never exhausted by the intention of its author. As the work passes from one cultural or historical context to another, new meanings may be culled from it, which were perhaps never anticipated by its author or contemporary audience. Right? So there is a possibility that the meaning of a text are not fixed because the historical context changes, right? Because there are certain other variables. So we have now moved from phenomenology, the essence of things, we positing the reality, to um, Heidegger creating space for history, but a passive reception of the text. And then we have moved on to Gadamer, who basically says that the meaning of a text can shift depending on where we are and who is receiving it. But also, the space that he also creates is by placing the reading of a text or a literary text exactly in history is by saying that we also approach the text with certain pre-decided prejudices, right? Or certain pre-understandings, and that's crucial which will be theorized later by later scholars, is that our interaction with the text is never unmotivated. We don't enter a text as a blank slate upon which the text ins inscribes its meanings. We already have certain cultural, educational, political ideas that constitute our reading self that is constituted in history and that we bring to a text. And that leads us to the concept of the hermeneutical circle. Now, hermeneutics, as we said, is the study of meanings. So the way then post Gadamer, the reading of literary texts then is performed or is can be performed is into this circular movement, right? I am one point in that circle. I bring myself to the text as this historical being with my prejudices and preferences. I read the text, which is the arrived intention of the author. Then I go out into the world in which the text was produced and is consumed, gather that knowledge bring it to myself. And in this circular movement, the text, the world, and the reader are constantly parts of the meaning-making process. The text itself isn't the only thing that constitutes meaning. So now we have reached a point in Eagleton's discussion where there is a room to enter the reader, okay? Because we have acknowledged that the text contains partially the intention of the author, but it's historical, that we exist in history, that we bring our own predecided dispositions, prejudices, and preferences to a text. And that then is what becomes reader response criticism or reception theory, because now, through these historical discussions, philosophical discussions, we have reached a point where we can argue that the reader also matters, that the reader's act of reading is never unmotivated, that the reader has the right and the privilege to construe meanings from a text. And those meanings would be contextual historically, would be contextual um, because the reader brings his or her own politics, his or her own being in the world to the text, right? And uh, and then, then he goes on to the discussion of several people who are reader response theorists, right? On page 67, uh, he gives us the Roman Ingarden's view, 
which is, I already briefly touched upon it, which is that we enter a text with, with certain pre-understandings. Now the text can reshape them, but most of the times we read a text or reduce a text with these pre-understandings. So if we buy into the notion that there are certain pre-understandings that we bring to a text, we know then that in the meaning making process, we, the reader, form a party, right? Uh, what could be some of those pre-understandings? So, for example, you know, my understanding that certain texts can be political, right? So I read 1984 and I bring to it my pre-understanding of the form itself, the novelistic form, but also of communism, right? Of totalitarianism, my understanding of symbols, right? All of those pre-understandings then have a bearing upon the text itself. Even understanding the tone forms a kind of pre-understanding which enables us to read the text sometimes differently. For example, imagine any um, ironic text. If you lack an understanding of irony, you will flatten it out and absolutely miss the people. I mean, remember, do you know some of the people, family members or friends who sometimes post a story from The Onion on Facebook and look at this is the awful thing so-and-so has done. And the reason they do that is because they don't have the pre-understanding of knowing that The Onion is a satirical magazine, right? And, and so these are the pre-understandings that we bring to a text. And then we go to, uh, you know, Wolfgang, Ezer, right? Uh, another reception theorist, reader response critics. And his idea is that, you know, we all bring to a text a certain code of reference. Now, the text itself teaches us its own code of reference too. But we also bring that to it. And the discussion of that is on page 68. But increasingly, as we move towards the end of the chapter, the reader is becoming more and more prominent. Um, the next the most important essay probably is by Barth, right? Death of the Author. I have taught it several times. It's a really brief essay. But in the essay, what Barth is claiming is that the primacy of the text was based in the assumptions that meaning is contained in it, that authorial intention is contained in it, that the author's voice must be respected. But we have now reached a stage where the author can no longer control the meaning of the text because we have entered the time of the reader, where the reader takes a text and in the act of reading makes it his or her own. And hence, the author, the moment the author has written a text and passed it on to the readers, the author has, is dead, right? Because the reader takes on the act of reading and the act of making meaning from the text. Another important person that he discusses is uh, Hans Robert Haas, or Joss, I don't know how to pronounce it. And I've used this concept too. And he's also discussing, you know, what do we bring to a text and why? can there be sometimes misunderstandings of the text or multiple readings of the text? And what he's suggesting is that whenever we start reading a text based on our own experiences, our own education, the time in which we exist, where literary criticism is, there is a horizon of expectations that's built into our consciousness because of our training, because of our reading, because of our understanding of literary theory. And we bring that horizon of expectations to a text. So our interaction with it is highly motivated. Right? We may not even be aware of it, but if, let's say, I read a novel and I don't like it, what is that not liking based in? And that's based in what is my horizon of expectation. So what does that mean? What do I expect from a great novel? What kind of storytelling? What kind of characters? And in a certain time frame, in literary theory or studies, there is generally a consensus about what to expect. And we all bring that horizon of expectations to the reading of a novel or a text. And sometimes um, Joss would argue and does argue that a novel is produced at a time where, where it has exceeded 
the contemporary horizon of expectations, right? Where the critics have not caught up with what it is doing, right? And there is a horizontal gap, that's what he calls it, between how the critics are trained to read a text and the kind of text that is being produced. And because of that gap, during that time, the critics would completely misread that novel. And the only way for them to read it correctly is when over time that hor horizontal gap has been eliminated and critics have now reached a point where now they can understand this novel better. So again, the reader has now entered as the most significant presence in the act of reading and interpretation, right? Now we are where we are saying, yeah, we enter a text with certain pre-understandings, but we also enter the text knowing or having internalized a horizon of expectations. So we are then literally and you know otherwise into the reader response criticism. And then probably the biggest name in reception theory and reader response criticism is Stanley Fish, right? because he's the one who theorizes quite a few important tropes and vocabularies of reader response criticism. And one of them is interpretive, interpretative strategies or interpretive communities. So what is the question that he's trying to answer? I think um, Eagleton discusses that in the chapter. So I'll briefly sum up is the question that he's trying to answer is that if the reader can read a text any which way he or she wants, then why is it that there are not thousands of readings of a literary text, right? Why is it that we can pretty much group them into certain different readings that defies this whole idea that readers are free to read whatever they want in a text based on their own experience? And his argument is that at any time as readers, we always imperceptibly maybe, through our training, through our socialization, belong to one or the other interpretive community. A community that has their own way of reading, their own way of responding, evaluating and valuing things in a text. And when we interact with the text, we bring the logic of that interpretive community and its strategies to the text, right? And because of that, reader response criticism has a certain logic to it, and it's not a free for all, right? And what he also argues in one of his book, I think it is, is there a text in this class or something like that, where he says that not only do we have our own interpretative strategies as an interpretative community, we are usually also aware of other communities who read differently. And in our writings, in our critical work, we incorporate a refutation of our competing communities, right? And that so what it tells us is that even though I'm reading a text as an individual student or scholar, it's not just an individual interaction. I am interacting with a text with the strategies, with the logic and practices of whatever interpretive community I am a part of, right? So we've come full circle. I mean, to conclude, we started this chapter from Eagleton's discussion of Husserl, the importance of phenomenology, especially in discussing with us that we intend things and to understand the essence of things, we must bracket out all the irrelevant information, right? That gets adopted into the phenomenological criticism where the critics to understand the text bracket out everything that they consider irrelevant to the text. Then we move to Heidegger who places the being itself, ourselves, the being in history, but somewhat being as a recipient of the knowledge that the world has to give it. Gadamer changes that by suggesting that now we exist in history, but historical interaction with the text can change depending on where we are in the history. Then we move into people who actually practice reader response criticism, reception theory, you know, people like Wolfgang Ezer, 
um, Hans Robert Joss and Stanley Fish. And by the time we get to the end of it, we have now been educated through this text, Literary Theory, Chapter 3 by Terry Eagleton, as to how does the reader and the reader's reception enter literary criticism and that it's not an act of individual reading if we go by Stanley Fish, but it's because of so many other things outside of us, our training, our politics, our being part of a certain community that believes certain things about literary education and literary readings that determines for a reader the kind of meanings he or she construes from a text, right? But by the end of this chapter then, in Eagleton's literary theory, we have now reached a point from new criticism, which had the primacy of the text, to a point in literary theory where the reader is not only relevant, but probably the most significant part of literary readings of texts of literary criticism. So that's all I have today. Uh, I, this is a really complex chapter. So if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the comment section. Please also watch other videos. I'll uh, leave a link to those uh, below. And next time I will um, record a lecture about the next chapter of Terry Eagleton. Until then, thank you so much and see you next time.